All right. Thanks for being here. My name is Christy Cox, and I am a uh, EDS patient advocate who had the opportunity recently by joining the Global Genes Rare Compassion Partner Program um, to meet a bright young medical student um, named Nadia, who's going to introduce herself here in a moment. And through this partnership, uh, they put uh, patients with rare disease or families with medical students that are future doctors so that we can, you know, exchange information and ideas. And as Nadia and I have been meeting and learning about one another and what we do, we had this idea that, you know, maybe we should learn what the other person's perspective is when we come into that really short and uh, important appointment together. And so I've shared with her from a patient perspective, some of the things that, you know, are kind of going through my mind of, you know, I only have 10 minutes with you and how am I going to optimize this? And she shared some really interesting information about what medical students learn in med school about how to prepare for a patient appointment, which she's going to describe to you. So Nadia, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're going to school? Yeah. Hi, everyone. So like Christy said, I'm Nadia. I'm, I guess, a second year medical student now. I'll start my second year in July, but I just finished my first year. Thank you. I go to a medical school in New Jersey. Um, I'm from New Jersey, so stayed here for pretty much all of my schooling. But yeah, like Christy talked about, like we kind of saw from like we could learn from each other's perspectives. So we thought about, you know, doing this little presentation. Like I said, I just finished my first year. So this is what I know now. So it's definitely like a student doctor perspective and it would definitely will develop as I continue on in my training, but we thought this could be helpful just as like an intro for like patients and providers alike. So whenever, do you want me to get started? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it's sort of like the, you know, doctor meets patient, you know, the protocol of, of what you're trained to go through and um, you're going to tell us about it. And, and it was fascinating to me. It, it's called soap notes. Um, mm -hmm. And, and you're going to share that with us. And uh, we'll we'll go through and talk about some of the things that you've learned from med school and some of the things that you hope come out of, you know, kind of the future of medicine. And, you know, just thank you again, Nadia, and for being here and sharing your time and your wisdom. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm going to share my screen. I see it. Yeah, perfect. Slideshow. Let's see if it goes back and forth. Okay. So again, student doctor's perspective of a patient encounter. So this is really just something like what I've learned in my first year and like what I think about before going in to a standardized patient's room. So we always start out with the introduction. So I introduce myself to the patient. I make sure to give my full name, my pronouns, um, my year of schooling, as well as the doctor I'm working under. I explain like, what am I here to do? Am I here to get a history? Am I here to do, you know, a brief physical exam to do both? I always make sure to ask if it's okay to do those things. Sometimes patients don't want students in the room and that's totally fine. So we just check in with you there to see like, would you like me in here? Is it okay if I'm in here? Then I check the patient's name and date of birth and I ask how the patient would like to be referred to. So preferential name as well as pronouns as well when I'm writing my soap note. So the soap note. So this is how I pretty much kind of organize um, when I'm in the room, like getting all that information from the patient. And this is a pretty common way for healthcare providers to document their encounter with a patient. So there's four headings, subjective, objective, assessment, and plan. And we're gonna go through all four of them. Subjective is pretty much like the big part um, of the note. So we start off with the chief complaint. And this is the problem that the patient is reporting, usually put in their own words. So they might come in and say, oh, I can't breathe, I have chest pain, decreased appetite, you know, um, I have some stomach issues, and we write that up at the top. And that doesn't mean that's the only complaint that the patient may have that day, but it's their main complaint. It's what they came in for. Then we have our HPI. So it's a description of the chief complaint, and it starts with a sentence describing the patient. So it'll be like Jane Doe is a 30-year-old female presenting with abdominal pain. And then we would move forward to describe the chief complaint based on different questions that we've asked the patient to understand all we can about this complaint. Before before you go forward, if you'd go back, oh, mm -hmm. you're going to go through HPI. I was going to say, what is HPI? So that's what we're going to about to get okay. to. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah. So these are the questions and you might see different mnemonics describing the questions. Um, 
but this is like the basic of it. So you have onset. When did the chief complaint begin? And what were you doing when the chief complaint began? Was it an accident? Were you outside doing an activity? Were you just resting at home? Then you have location. So where is this chief complaint located? Does it radiate? Duration, how long does the chief complaint last? Is it constant? If it's not constant, how long does it last when you feel it? Does it wax? Does it wane? Characterization, how does the patient describe the chief complaint? Sharp, stabbing, dull, a pressure, et cetera. And then you have your alleviating and aggravating factors. So what makes it worse and what makes it better? And this can include things like exacerbation. So like, oh, well, I used to work out a lot, but now I can't because um, it really hurts to do that. It also includes things like maybe there are certain medications that make it better. Um, a lot of times we talk with patients with some kind of muscle pain, they'll talk about like icy hot and that kind of thing. So that's what we're looking for there. Then there's severity. So we'll ask you on a scale of one to 10 with, should we say one being the least and 10 being the worst? How does the patient rate the pain? Social psychological impact. How does the chief complaint impact the patient's life? So are you able to go to work? with this chief complaint? Are you able to continue the hobbies you like to do with this chief complaint? And then associated symptoms. So any other symptoms you might've noticed that you associate with the chief complaint that wasn't there before. All right, so let me pause you before you go on. So yep. the subject, I mean, I'm kind of breaking this down to kindergarten common sense. Um, so the subjective part is the, you know, we're just gonna ask you some questions and HPI stands for history of patient history intake. Of history of present illness. History of present illness. Okay. And so, you know, we're going through, you know, what's going on? When did it start? Where, you know, where is it? How long? Describe it. Mm. Um, I know alleviating and aggravating factors is, you know, something that's important that a patient needs to be prepared to answer those kinds of questions. Um, that's not the language that we would use. So mm. it's good to, you know, understand these terms. <clears throat> I'm sorry to pause you in the middle. But, you know, it's just sort of going to common sense of helping us understand how we can better prepare to answer these questions. So thanks for going through that. Uh, I'll let you go ahead. Yeah. And like I said, like this might not, this is what I'm taught, but as doctors like go forward with their um, training, they become more efficient. So you might not see all these labeled out, like the way I still need them to be to make sure I'm actually asking the patient everything that I need to, to better understand what they're coming in with today. Right. And for, for example, I know, um, you know, in the patient community, there's a lot of uh, challenge with, for example, the pain scale, you know, like how do, how do we, how do we explain to you and, and on a scale of one to 10, kind of where we are, you know I mean? Because it's very subjective and it's dynamic. So yeah, it, it's, it's trying to find a way to be able to communicate with each other. So go ahead. So more for the subjective, we ask about your medical history or it might come over um, in your electronic health records, but past medical history, so any chronic conditions that you have, past surgical history, medications, which includes like vitamins or supplements that you may take, as well as any allergies you have and any, what is the reaction to that allergen. We also ask about family history, so first degree relatives, parents, siblings, children, ask about any chronic conditions they may have, if they're alive or if they've passed on. And if they did pass on, does the patient know what it was from? And that's basically what we garnered there. Then we get into social history, which is another big part of subjective. And I just like to point out here, before we go into social history, um, we're taught to always kind of like take a second and preface this part by just saying like, hey, some of the um, questions I'm going to ask you, like they do ask about sensitive information. Like, I just want to let you know, this is so we have more information to treat you better. It's not going to go anywhere. It's not getting reported to anyone. Like it's just so that we can better understand your life habits and we can help you. That's all. There's no judgment here just to understand how you live your everyday life. So we start off with smoking. Do you smoke? How much do you smoke? Did you used to smoke? When did you stop? And the big one now is do you use any other nicotine products? Just because now we have like vaping and that kind of thing. So it may not be cigarettes that they are smoking. Alcohol, same thing. Do you drink any alcohol? How often will you drink containing, um, have a drink containing alcohol? And when you do drink, how many drinks are you having? And what do you drink? Just to kind of better understand, like some people may say, oh, like I only drink on the weekend. So you just have to make sure you understand what does their weekend mean to them? Do they only have a four-day work week? So it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. 
compared to Saturday and Sunday. So just really being specific here, drug use, any recreational drug use now or in the past, any IV drug use now or in the past, occupation. So this kind of covers a lot of not only employment, but education as well as like living styles. So do you have employment outside of your home? What is your highest level of education? Who lives in your household in addition to you? And do you feel safe at home? You have nutrition. So do you follow a certain diet, keto, vegan, vegetarian? How often do you eat out? Do you get in your daily amounts of fruits and vegetables? And you always document caffeine intake here. You also have exercise. So, you know, what do you do for exercise? How often do you exercise? For how long do you exercise if possible? And then sexual history. This isn't all the questions here, but I did um, just want to kind of put like some of them that we asked, like, are you sexually active? Are you in a relationship where you feel threatened or in physical danger? Do you feel safe? Um, you know, we ask about, you know, pregnancies or barrier protection, oral contraception, you know, have you been treated or tested for an STI, things like that, but that's not the full amount of questions. I just kind of threw a couple in there, but that is, sorry, um, our social history. And then the very last part of our subjective, which is review of systems. So it's questions organized by organ system to help healthcare providers screen patients for different conditions. So these are just some examples of what we would ask about. Um, in different categories. So general, fever, chills, fatigue, cardio, always ask about chest pain, you can ask about palpitations, uh, pulmonology, so the lungs, any shortness of breath, any coughing, any dyspnea or exertion, so when you're trying to work out, do you get shortness of breath, gastrointestinal, GI, nausea, vomiting, a sour taste in the mouth after eating. This is not um, the full amount of what you can ask. Again, these are just examples. There are many, many, many other things that you could talk about and many other system, organ systems that you could ask about, depending on what the patient needs. Then we finally get into our objectives, so our O of the soap note. Here we're gonna do vital signs. So again, just gave an example of what that is. So it'd be blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, that's RR, temperature, pulse ox, height and weight. So really things you're measuring, they're not subjective anymore. Physical exam findings, and again, it depends on what you're looking for. So again, I just put in some common ones, some ones we've done in our standardized patient encounters. So general, you would say something about like their appearance. They are well-appearing, age-appropriate female cardio. You'd listen to the heart, the carotids. Is there a regular rate and rhythm? Do you hear any brewies in the carotids? Home, you listen to the lungs. Are they clear bilaterally? bilaterally? Do you hear rails, ronchi, or wheezing? And neuro, just like position sensation, muscle strength, deep tendon reflexes. It really depends if you're doing like a central nervous system exam or peripheral. And then of course, any imaging or lab results would also go in this section as well. Assessment, so pretty short and sweet because we didn't do like a case here. So I couldn't really say like what my assessment would be, but our differential diagnoses. Um, and we also include chronic conditions in here as well. So if you're someone who came in and you told me during like your past medical history, you have hypertension or high blood pressure, I would also still put this in here just so that we can acknowledge it in the very last part of the soap note, which is our plan. So what are the next steps? We have to address everything in the assessment. That doesn't mean we're going to have one thing in the plan for one thing in the assessment. One test might cover a couple of our differentials, um, but we need to make sure that we're addressing everything. So this could include future tests like lab results, or getting labs or imaging consults. So depending on what we think the problem might be, it might be out of like a general practitioner scope. So we got to send you to a specialist to get these tests done. Um, continuing your medication, increasing, decreasing meds, uh, prescribing new medication, counseling for like nutrition or exercise. Um, and it, as always, a follow-up, just in case you would ever need to see us again. We always throw in the follow-up in there just to um, have you come back into the office so we can, again, monitor whatever you came in in the first place, if you need it. Sometimes patients will cancel and be like, no, I'm fine. Like, everything we did that first time worked. But that's it. That's basically what I know now. Uh, so I will. That, sound, that sounds like a, a lot of work. So so that for a doctor, a soap note is, you know, the, the protocol that you're going through that you're um, using to assess, okay, you know, the, this obviously the subjective and the measurable data of what's going on with the patient in front of you. And then, you know, the assessment is your opinion of what you think is going on. And, you know, is this, you know, 
patient suffers from X, Y, Z, or, you know, maybe that's where you say we need to look further into, you know, something else. Um, and then of course, plan is, you know, what are we going to do about it? You know, so it, it's the the organized nature of what's going to happen in a doctor's mind in that, you know, short period that insurance allows us to be together. Um, and then, you know, based on that, a patient, you know, could leave there and, you know, hopefully they've written some things down. They had questions for you, you know, they went through it and then they understand kind of what their action items coming out of this meeting. But, you know, you're, you're problem solving this issue with them and you're building trust and, you know, a, a relationship to be able to support one another in, you know, wellness. So is there anything that you would recommend, you know, to, to patients in general, like, for example, you know, I'm going to go into a new doctor appointment and, you know, maybe I should sort of like think through this checklist, you know, of, you know, the kinds of questions that you're going to ask me uh, and how do I better prepare for that appointment? Any, any recommendations? I mean, I think the first thing that like pops in my head and this is something I do, is just like, if you ever like come across a question, even if your appointment's weeks away, like write it down, write it down, have your medications written down, just stuff that's like not easy to pull from memory. Um, just have all those things because you're going to be filling out paperwork if this is a new provider. Like a lot of times records will come over. We're doing a really good job with that with like electronic health records becoming standardized and being able to be transferred. But I would just have a list of like medications of like past specialists you've seen, like, you know, past imaging that you have had and just write down your question just so when you get there, I know sometimes I'll get to the doctor and they'll be like, so anything else? I'll be like, no. And then I'll leave. And I did have um, a bunch more questions for them. But I think that, you know, can be helpful just from like um, a provider like perspective, because when you come up with questions like I know, like what you also want to cover today so I can help cover that as well. Yeah, I know with my own experience, just <laughs> so many doctor appointments and, you know, trying to optimize that window, you know, I've sort of figured out this system that I try to identify, you know, like really hone down you know, whether I'm doing it uh, in, in preparation in advance, which I believe is really important mm -hmm. is, you know, I mean, you got to have your information, you got to have your act together, your questions, you got to document it. I firmly believe in writing it down because, you know, our brains are just going in too many directions when we're in there um, is, you know, what is the, what is the goal of my appointment? Like, why am I here? What am I trying to learn you know, like to try to identify, you know, am I, am I trying to like get a, a prescription? Am I trying to get a, a test ordered? You know, am I just completely starting from ground zero and need to know where to go next? Mm -hmm. And, and then I try to organize it into like, what are my top three things that I want to bring up? Because, you know, there's so many things that can kind of derail the appointment and go off into tangents. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I try to like bring myself back to the, okay, you know, I want to make sure I ask about X or, you know, and, and I prepare these things, whether it's in writing or it's on my phone or whatever it is to kind of keep my brain fog at bay and, and be able to stay focused. Um, do you, do you think that's a pretty good way to get prepared like mentally as a patient? Yeah, absolutely. I think just like having what you want, like written down. Um, just so you can have those like discussions. We can have those two-way discussions about like what we can achieve during this appointment and what we might need to make another appointment for just because of the time constraints. Yeah, well, great. This is um this is really good information and I appreciate it. So, you know, it, anything you want to share about, you know, what you've gone through in your first year of medical school and, you know, how you feel or what you're looking forward to? Yeah, I mean, it was really nice to like give this presentation because a year ago I wouldn't have known any of it. Um, so it did kind of like show to me that even though this year has been like very long, um, and we have learned a lot, like I have retained one, some of it and <laughs> two, that, um, it's like all learning process for all of us. Like, like I said, this is from a first year student's perspective. So I could give this same talk next year and be like, actually scratch that. Like I have either all this new information to give you. So I always just want to like emphasize that like what I'm giving now is like we're just learning everything. Um, and then once we get into our practice, like those things we will become more efficient. We'll find like 
what we like and, you know, kind of find our like groove and how we interact with patients. Um, so this was just one perspective. It would be very cool to see like how other schools teach it and such. But yeah, I think I've been very like, I'm very grateful to my school for what they have taught us. Like, I really enjoy our curriculum. I think they take a lot of care, not only to teach us medical sciences, but also like the humanism of medicine and empathy and such. So that's something I'm just like really grateful for and why I like applied to the school and chose to go to this school. Um, but yeah, I'm excited for year two. Like it's going to be a little tougher apparently. So they say, so I'm just preparing myself for that. Um, but yeah, that's just grateful and very like energized. It was really nice to do that and be like, okay, like, I can yeah. share. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. So, you know, a typical, just for, for those of us that are not very familiar with it, ex- describe to us a typical uh, med student sort of, you know, how many years do you do this? And then, and then what happens after that? And what do you have to do to kind of get board certified? Explain that process simply to us. So from what I know about it so far, this is like the big overview. So you graduate from high school, and you go um, and you have to get a bachelor's degree of some sort. Um, A lot of times we think that it has to be in some kind of science background, which I did. I have a bachelor's of arts in just general biology, but you actually don't have to. Um, A lot of my classmates have, you know, humanities degrees because all you need to apply to medical school is a certain amount of classes. So I don't have it up in front of me, like what the credits are, but you need to so many like chemistry classes, organic chemistry classes, biochem, general biology, physics. So that's actually like a really nice thing to know about because if you would like to go into medical school, but you'd also like to pursue something else while you're in university, that is still possible. It's still very possible. You don't need the STEM degree to apply. You just need to make sure that you are completing all of the requirements of the certain schools that you're applying to, which are usually standardized, but can kind of vary. So you get that bachelor's degree. Gap years are very actually like popular right now. I took one. I have friends that took two or three. I have one friend who came straight from undergrad. So she had a month off and came right into medical school. So it really depends on your journey. Um, And if you feel ready to take the MCAT, if you liked your MCAT score, um, MCAT is the medical college admissions test. So that's the big test we have to take to get into medical school. Um, It is a very long test. I think I was in the testing center for about eight hours. Uh, so definitely a very long test, but that's our first like big test, I guess. Then you get into medical school. You're here. What do you do now? So it's usually about four years. There are some medical schools who have special programs. If you say no, like I know I'm going to be a primary care physician. I know I want to be a certain physician. They might actually have three-year programs. Also, some schools offer dual degrees. So you could get like your MD and your JD. So you could be lawyer, doctor, or DO, PhD. Um, They also, a lot of schools offer like masters in public health as well as like MBAs. So those are all options as well. So could be four years, could be many more years, depending on what your goals in the future are. You made it through medical school. What do you do now? You apply to residency. Again, residency can vary on how long it's going to be. So shortest is about three years and it could be all the way up to seven years and it really depends on like what you are applying into usually like your surgery ones are going to be your much longer ones then you could stop I mean once you graduate medical school you are technically a doctor but you need to go through residency to make sure you can practice um what's it called like uh individually independently during this time you've taken your first boards at the end of your second year um, you've taken your second boards at the end of your third year. Usually a lot of people try to get this score before they apply to residency, just to have it on their application. Um, and then you have a third boards. I don't know when you take that yet. That is far into my future at this point, but I think it's <laughs> sometimes during residency. You finish residency, you can stop there. Um, but you don't have to because then you could go into a fellowship. And this fellowship could be either honing in on a certain amount of skills that you have. You go from like kind of like general to even more specific. Um, It could just be like adding on to your skill set. So it really depends. And most fellowship programs are anywhere from like one to three years. So in total, we've done like four years of undergrad. We'll say no gap years, but they are becoming like increasingly popular. Four years of medical school if we just went, you know, with no dual degrees, even if we did like 
four years of residency, we're at 12, and then we want to do a fellowship, two years, 14, like 14 years. And that's just like a made up example. So it is a very long training process. It's very grueling. Um, but I think if you love it, and I think like always reflect, like I took a gap year just to make sure this is something I wanted to commit my life to, because for the rest of my life, I will have to like renew my license. Apparently it's every two years. I just learned that not super sure. Um, how true that is but like every two years you got to renew your license and like do continual continuing medical education like this is this is like a big career lifelong path. this yeah. is lifelong learning um so just like taking that into account like I think it's a great career path um but definitely a grueling one like it's something you have to want to do and be very motivated to do it yeah and then you know in the future you can share with us about how you decide about you know are, are you a GP, a general, you know, are you a DO, MD, your special, I have to sneeze, your specialization, <laughs> sorry, you know, so I mean, like the, all kinds of research and, and decision making on, on the student's part about, you know, which way you want to go, and, and you know, not only is it, you know, like incredible amounts of detailed anatomy and data and science, but, you know, as you mentioned earlier, it's, it's learning the the compassion and mm -hmm. the empathy and the human experience of, you know, w why you're doing what you're doing to help people. So it's a very, very noble profession. And, you know, I personally am so grateful for people like you, you know, who are dedicating their life to this and, and also for people like you who are, um, volunteering your time to, you know, meet with people like me in programs from global genes, and, you know, to share your experiences and to learn new things and, you know, kind of open your aperture. So, you know, again, thank you. I know one thing that the, um, the, e that particularly the EDS audience is mm -hmm. going to be curious about, uh, and I've shared with you uh, a lot of my EDS experience is, you know, we're, we're told in our community that uh, medical providers are sort of taught or trained to, like listen for hoof beats mm -hmm. in the sense of, you know, and that means like look for commonalities and, and things that you see, whether it's across your patients or, you know, across symptoms and things. And so it's, it's sort of designing to, to go to like the most common denominator. Um, like you have the sniffles, you have, a, you know, a runny nose and an itchy cough. Okay. You have a cold, you know, yeah. that, that's kind of the thinking. Um, well, in our world of connective tissue disorder, we're often symptoms all over the place, cross symptom, uh, cross systemic, you know, mm -hmm. gastro, cardio, you know, doesn't make sense. And so it's really hard to recognize and figure out what's going on with us. And so, you know, the, the old saying is, you know, don't just listen for hoof beats because occasionally there are zebras, meaning mm -hmm. that we're rare, you know, so many of us identify kind of with that, that zebra icon, um, is there anything you can share with us about, you know, have they addressed anything like that with you yet? Or is that in future classes? So I think like we definitely still talk about that because you don't want to jump to like something you feel is like the most rare, right? You got to get imaging for that. Like first you start with like the most common just because, you know, let's get the imaging for this. Let's get the lab results for this. Like this is what I think it is. If it's not, then we can move forward. Also, you got to think about insurance. Like they'll only cover certain things. So I can't always jump to like a test that I would like to before getting like whatever they require before that. But I think it has been um, talked about, like one of my professors that I'm thinking about right now, like he told us in one of our last lectures before we left for the year, like if you're not thinking about it, then you're not gonna address it. Um, and he was regarding like certain pathology, like we were talking about vasculitis at the time, but he's like, you have to keep everything at the forefront of your mind, just sitting there. It doesn't mean that's what it is. It doesn't mean, that you know you're going to diagnose it as that but guess what if it's not even on your mind well then you're never going to reach that point anyway and then we're going to leave with no diagnosis so I think we are kind of like it's a balance you know it is a very hard balance to make and I'm sure it's very frustrating from the patient perspective when we're like we've tried all the common stuff like not really sure where to go here especially when you have something that's multi-systemic and so you're going to all these different providers and they're all kind of doing um, their own thing and then once they start collaborating they'll kind of realize like oh like maybe this is 
you know, something else that we didn't like really realize because I didn't see those test results for you because they were the different specialist. So I think they are and they do um, acknowledge that. It's just that's why we do in our curriculum, like we do the differential diagnoses, like we do case based learning. Um, and what we do in our CBL sessions is we're given 20 differential diagnoses. And we're given like um, an HPI, like history, and then we're given social history and family history later. And basically as a group, we have to go through and kind of like talk and support our answers and why we want to get rid of something, why we want to keep something and kind of discuss like, well, are you going to keep this over one symptom or is it more likely like this other thing? So they are teaching us like how to collaborate, how to, you know, be able to effectively support your position and really how to look at the whole patient rather than just like, oh, I see this one symptom. This is what it's going to be. No, because like it's a collection of symptoms. So we kind of see like what fits best. Um, but yeah, I think after that very long answer, yes, like we yeah, are. No, that's great. Um, I mean, I know in the EDS world, one of the things that, 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 you know, we say commonly is if you can't connect the issues, think connective tissues, you know, because it's like, you know, that, that's sort of the, the mantra of, you know, what we might say to a doctor, you know, cause it's just all this various things going on. And, you know, that's when you start to think about, okay, what, what are the commonalities here? The commonality mm -hmm. is the connective tissue runs across all of these things and it affects, you know, veins and tendons and, and maybe there's an issue in that itself. Okay. So that's great. Um, it, the only other thing I want to ask you is, you know, we've talked a little bit about like the electronic records and, you know, the future of healthcare in, in terms of, you know, the, the value that those kinds of things of, you know, whether it's like digital or AI, you know, are going to bring to it. But, you know, what do you, what do you hope personally for the future of medicine and generations to come? You know, what would you like to see as part of your, your training and, and the outcomes that you can be a part of? Yeah. Something that I've like really like to see in my like peers alone is just like how aware they are and how much they care about like patients experiences and they take so seriously like not only like our blocks like our anatomy block and like our biochem block but we also have like a longitudinal community service course and how seriously they took like learning that we did presentations at the end and we have like community service projects so that's something like I'm really looking forward to like it's not very tangible I guess in a like maybe measurement way but just like doctors already care but I feel like this new generation of doctors coming in like they care a lot and they're really putting forth this effort to not only expand on their medical knowledge but as well as like be compassionate and be empathetic and I think like even though the medical um, profession already is filled with compassionate individuals I think it's going to be even filled even more with compassionate individuals so I just like to see like we're going in that like direction um, that's something I really look forward to and I also hope to look forward to like kind of bringing in this sense of like wellness, like when um, like obviously we'd love to treat everything and make everything go away and be better. But unfortunately, like we can't treat everything. So how do we kind of turn our perspective to how can I help you live your best life? How can I minimize your discomfort? How can I, you know, um, increase your abilities how can I help you in that way? So I think kind of like taking that all or none approach away, like, and being like, well, I can't cure you. Well, we don't need a cure. We just need to be able to as best support you in living the life you would like to live. Um, and I think that's something that we've talked about a lot as well um, in my curriculum, just how, how do we help patients reach the goals they want? Mm -hmm. um, and how do we do that for them and what's feasible? So I think those are my two big things, like wellness and compassion. That's great. And I'm, as a patient, super happy to hear that those are your top priorities. You know, I know, I know from, from our perspective, you know, it's a lot about, um, you know, symptom management and illness and, you know, the, it's, it's like a, a system that's built for sick yeah. and it would be really wonderful to have a medical system that was, you know, designed and built for optimizing wellness you know, and, and, and taking all the preventative measures and all the, you know, daily proactive things that people need to do that, you know, many of us know, and, you know, some of us do, and some of us don't, but, 
you know, it's, it's, it's taking better, better care of ourselves before we have dis-ease set in. So, yeah. Well, again, anything else you want to add, Nadia? Yeah, I think we covered like a lot, like I'm happy to do like another session like this, but this was like a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I was really <laughs> impressive. The amount of stuff that you've learned and, you yeah. know, thank you again for sharing your time yeah, and for you know, me. look forward to putting this out um, and, and sharing with the community because like I was fascinated by this, you know, soap notes, you know, like this is the process that your brain is going through when mm -hmm. I'm on the other side. Like I may have driven three hours to get the appointment and I sat in the lobby for 45 minutes and then I sat in the waiting room for another half hour. So when you walk in, I'm immediately, you know, like, okay, oh my God, it's my time. Uh, what do I say? You know, so if I don't have things written down or if I don't have prepared question or I haven't brought reports or data, you know, I mean, I, I'm kind of wasting my time. So, you know, it's that getting prepared for the doctor appointment for both, not only the doctor, but for the patient. And I really am grateful for your perspective on this. So, and look forward to the things that we're going to learn over the next couple of months while we meet. And, uh, you know, all the best to you in your studies and, and hopefully a break this summer. And um, again, thanks, Nadia. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.